Father, again, I stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the privilege and the opportunity to feast upon your word. As we approach your word, we realize just how infinite that it is and just how finite we are. May the Holy Spirit be the one who teaches us. You promised that you would lead us into all truth. May he be the one who filters out all of the foolishness, the ignorance, the error, but seal to our heart that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we're studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had reached the end of the 18th verse of chapter 15. Romans 15 verse 18. We've looked at our responsibilities to accept the walk that the Lord has given us, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Not that we try to make ourselves acceptable to God, but that we are, uh, we have been accepted in the Beloved. To be considerate of those who are weak and, and not to enter into arguments about scruples and to bear the infirmities of the weak and not please ourselves. And I've tried carefully to handle these passages of Scripture so that we understand that it is not the strong that should be brought down to the level of the weak. It is that they should understand the position of the weak, not entice them to do that which is contrary to their convictions and to support them in the sense of edification, to build them up, not bring uh, the strong down or to the level of the weak and not to tear down the weak by trying to build them up to be strong. That's not our responsibility. If you happen to be in the classification of the strong, your responsibility is to edify those who are weak, not to destroy them, nor are you to bring down the strong to the level of the weak. We looked at all of that and, and that the Jew was to recognize that God had a ministry to the Gentile. And so we have several qu quotes of Old Testament passages here pointing out that this is nothing new that it was always in God's program to bring the truth of the Word of God to the nations, and that's happening now. And the Romans should understand that there should not be a problem between a Jew and a Gentile. We are seeing that Paul was ministering Jesus Christ to the Gentiles as God's gospel, and he he quoted enough scripture to point out that it's always been that way. God's good news was always intended for the nations and it was set apart by the Holy Spirit. And I want to stop right here because a thought just came into my head that had, I didn't intend for this to be in the video, but I'll just throw this in here anyway. It seems remarkable or maybe I should say it doesn't seem remarkable that at this uh, at this stage of our study, at this at this latest stage, chapter 15, we're about to conclude Romans. That that God brings in the importance, uh, or just brings in the reality of the gospel itself. You know, I mean, you would you would uh, you would think that we by the time we've gotten to this point that we we would have been settled uh, as to the, uh, the matter of the gospel uh, concerning what the gospel is and, and that, you know, that God had, had, you know, somehow that we had moved past or moved beyond just the, the reality of the gospel into other aspects of doctrine that, uh, are subsequent to the gospel, but the, 
the, the interesting fact here is, is that the gospel is seen to be, is heavily seen in our present text. That's my point. And I find that quite in, intriguing. In verses 17 and 18, the Holy Spirit, as Paul point out, that he did nothing separate from the inspiration of and the direction of the Holy Spirit. It is Christ who worked through him. You see a vine branch uh, reality going on there. We see this in Acts, that it, it isn't the Acts of the Apostles. It's the Acts of Jesus Christ in the Apostles. And Paul is pointing that out here, that he, he wouldn't think, he wouldn't even dare to speak of anything that he might have done outside the direction that Christ had wrought in him. If Christ didn't bring it to pass in me, Paul's saying, then I don't even want to talk about it. I don't even want to mention it. It was by the power of God through Paul that the Gentiles were obedient in word and deed. Okay? I mean that's a very important factor that we have to fact uh, fact that we have to factor into the, all of this. Verse 19, God worked through mighty signs and wonders in the power of God's spirit and a great problem with Christians today is that they want signs and wonders when we have the complete word which they didn't have. They didn't have the New Testament that you and I have. And so God worked through signs and wonders. Today, he works through this book. Today, he works through his word. So it is God's spirit working in Paul so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, Paul says. 800,000 square miles approximately. It's a pretty large area. I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, and that, folks, is no exaggeration. The Holy Spirit doesn't exaggerate. This is what God said through Paul. The word fully preached, as I pointed out, is a Greek word that essentially means to bring to completion, and it happens to be in the perfect tense. So it's a bit of a stretch for any Bible teacher to suggest that, well, Paul's just exaggerating here. You know, just to exalt the work of God through the ministry of Paul, you know, in that area. We, now, we could look at that as saying that he didn't preach the gospel to every single individual, but to those to whom he preached, that it was fully preached, so that the fully preached doesn't mean the area, but the people that heard and that it was likely a, a small percentage of the entire population of that area. And that's probably the more normal approach to this verse. That Paul did a good job to all of those who heard him. Now, I have tried over the years to be as careful as I can pointing out to people that that though I speak dogmatically, I do not believe that I am some oracle of truth. So I'm going to simply tell you what I think it says. If we said that we wanted to evangelize some large city, the popular emotional approach to that is that we have to speak to every single individual. But we know absolutely from God's word that only his sheep can hear his voice. Why do you not believe me? God says, because you are not my sheep. And it is astounding to me how people can take the direct language of our Lord Jesus Christ and say, well, it doesn't mean that. The reason a person can't believe is because he's not God's sheep. The reason a person can believe is because he's God's sheep. So there's really not a lot of purpose to preaching to goats, as, as blunt as that may sound. I believe it to be absolute biblical truth. 
if one who is not God's sheep cannot hear, then it's a fruitless exercise to continue trying to preach to that person. I believe that the verse says that in a huge area, without radio, without television, you know, without fast Corvettes, you know, without an internet, the Holy Spirit had Paul reach every single child of God so that he brought to completion Christ's gospel. The gospel is preached, and the gospel of Christ seeks and saves that which is lost. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. And when we speak of that which is lost, we're speaking of those who are His. He shall save His people from their sins, Matthew 1.21. And there's our simple genitive again, Christ's good news. And it shocks me to the core to see what the world religious system has done to the good news over the years, just over the span of my lifetime. When you rescue some person, you save their life. You're not saving someone who's dead. You save someone who is living. And that, of course, is what the word means. The people that are saved are living people that are spiritually alive. If they weren't spiritually alive, they're spiritually dead, and it's a bit late to save them. And yet somehow or other, we've mixed the words all up. I don't believe that Paul went around presenting an invitation. I believe Paul was used by the Holy Spirit in a mighty way, a fabulous way, to reach absolutely every single one of those whom God had ordained in a huge area with the good news and it isn't good news with any strings attached it's good news good news for God's people who will hear they will hear he said that they would hear Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures and he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the good news. If the, and if that doesn't, if that, if that news, good news doesn't excite you, that's not my problem. I brought you God's good news. Christ died for your sins and he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the good news. I didn't tell you what to do. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't include anything, add anything to the good news that made that uh, dependent upon something that you did. How in the world could we take such fabulous good news and say, well, Christ did that if you want him to, but if you don't want him to, well, he really didn't do it. The good news doesn't say that Christ died for your sins if you'll do something. If they are his, they will hear and they will do something because they're his, not to, not to become his. That's what the word teaches. Not that it becomes effective if you accept him where the, the great responsibility rests on you. Or that in the end, ultimately, you know, uh, and I, this is the phrase that I've used often on, on occasion, that uh, it just all comes down to you, not Christ. You know, you hold the final trump card, so to speak. So you're the determining factor, not God. And where did, where did modern Christianity ever come up with such a thing? I know that's not what, what you folks have been used to hearing. I know that that's not what the world is being uh, subjected to that's not the gospel that that uh, you know what I'm what I'm telling you that, that the gospel is what I have always constantly and consistently presented as the gospel I know that's not what you're hearing and many of you probably find it shocking surprising unbelievable that, that what I could be telling you is the truth, yet that is what this book says. 
The good news doesn't say that Christ died for your sins if you'll do something. That, not that it becomes effective if you accept him or the great responsibility then rests on you. Paul was preaching Christ's good news to Christ's people, and that's exactly what the scriptures, the Holy Spirit quoted in this passage say, that God had a message for Gentiles. The promise is absolutely certain to all the seed. And leading seminaries today exhort the graduating class to go out and try to rescue God's people who are headed for hell. It's astounding what a leading seminary can do with the Word of God. They are absolutely persuaded that most of God's children are, are going to hell. And if we don't rescue them, then you know they're going to wind up in hell. You know, if that's the God that you worship, folks, he's not much of a God. What kind of a father would let his child go to hell? That is not the picture that Scripture paints for us as it regards this matter. The promise is absolutely certain to all the seed. I didn't say that. That's in Romans. We went through that passage of Scripture a few months ago. The promise is certain to all the seed because it's based on the faithfulness of Christ. That's what we have in verse 19. What was preached was the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. It's Christ's good news. He came to do the Father's will, and he completed it. He did that. He came to seek and save that which was lost. He came to deliver his people from their sins. He did that. They were already his people before they were ever delivered from their sins. The human author of this very epistle was already God's child before his Damascus Road experience. He, Paul, was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. If you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, please don't, don't totally rob that concept from all of its strength, all of its comfort, and all of its glory by suggesting that it'll turn out if you know, you're chosen if you accept Christ, and that choice depends entirely upon you. That is the modern gospel, and I believe it to be about as close to heresy as you can get. I've issued this challenge on numerous occasions. I've told people, show me one verse from the Bible that says that one is born again by something we do. And bear in mind, before you waste your time flipping through the pages, try searching for that verse, that verse has to be addressing a non-redeemed individual alive between the time of the crucifixion to the present. The fact is it cannot be done. I issue this challenge, and all I ever get is someone presenting a verse. Steve, here's a verse that, that says we're born again by something that, we're do, that we do, and the verse is talking about an already, it's speaking to already redeemed individuals who are being saved, that is delivered, which is not redemption, which is not even speaking of new birth because they fail to distinguish between the word redemption and salvation. And folks, if we are labeled as a heretic for preaching this, then we are suffering for the sake of Christ's gospel. That is why I'm not concerned about the number of views on these videos. I'll preach the gospel of Christ until I've run my course here below. And this good news, this, this gospel, not me, will reach the ears of his people. God says it will. Our responsibility is not to wring our hands over the fact that one of God's children might wind up in hell. That's God's job. Our responsibility is to fully minister Christ's gospel, and that's good news. It's absolutely good news, not limited by anything you can do. Walk into the modern Christian bookstore looking to buy a book that will tell you how to be born again, and you won't, you won't find one that will tell you the truth. You are not born again by accepting Christ. You are not born again by walking down an aisle. 
You're not born again by repentance. You're not born again by confession. You're not born again by acceptance or by belief or by anything else. You're born again by the will of God. And the word means born from above. And modern Christianity has stricken that verse from its man-centered narrative. That we are born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. Folks, if God's election of you depended upon your election of Him, God couldn't even call you elect, for you would have elected yourself. How strong a blindness rests upon those trying to save themselves before the Savior. The last calculations I ran was, was out of 7.7 .7 billion people, 2.4 billion classified as Christian, 1.2 being Protestant, most of whom believe that they earn heaven or have to earn it, leaving a staggering 0.2% who, 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 who truly trust in Christ alone. God does not wait upon nor depend upon a dead man's decision to resurrect him to life. Jesus didn't stand outside Lazarus' tomb and say, Lazarus, hey, if you'll just hear, if you'll do something, if you'll hear my voice, if you'll do something, you know, you'll become alive again. For all eternity you will rejoice in God having redeemed you by His will and His choice. And you're going to spend what precious time that you have here now accrediting that decision to yourself? The gospel is our, fa uh, our Heavenly Father calling His children to come home, which they will obey just as they'll, they will hear and obey just as the turbulent waves obeyed Christ and became peacefully still. They, they must, because God has commanded it. When God commands light to shine out of darkness, it does. When the gospel goes out, his people will hear and respond. They have to. It will be done. I believe, therefore I was born again, therefore I deserved grace, you didn't, you know, I deserved it, therefore I destroyed grace. Folks, uh, the price for finding him was losing me. Losing me. Okay? The same grace reigns as it regards our walk. The same grace that... that the same grace that applies to the subject of our redemption is working in our lives as it regards sanctification, growth. The same grace reigns as it regards our walk. We don't work to be blessed. It's because we have been so blessed that we work. And modern Christianity has turned that, flipped that around 180 degrees and put the cart before the horse. You know, if you do this, God will bless you. I have never once in my entire Christian life done anything so that God would bless me. I've never set about to do anything so that God would be pleased with me, that he would be, that I would become acceptable to God, that, that I, that he would bless me. What I what I have done is I've I've done a whole lot of stuff because he has blessed me. Because he has accepted me. If you're not born from above, you can't enter the kingdom of God. If you're not born from above, you can't understand the word of God. You're born from above by the will of God, not by the will of man. He said it, I didn't. It is incomprehensible what Christians have done with the human word born. When did any baby, folks, have any voice in his birth? Why would God choose those words? I believe it's important for us to stand up and proclaim the majesty and the glory of Jesus Christ. 
Who is glorified when I tell you that if you accept Christ, you'll go to heaven? If you don't accept him, you're going to hell. Who's glorified? Man is glorified. When I tell you that God Almighty became incarnate, that he might be your kinsman redeemer, and because he loved you, he died in your place, so that you stand before him, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight, Jesus Christ is glorified. The problem with the modern gospel is that it exalts man and it depresses Christ. God's not the all-powerful creator of heaven and earth. God is not the sovereign majesty of eternity, but God becomes some kind of a genie in a bottle or something that if we treat him right or rub him right, we'll get what we want. I have fully preached Christ's good news. To me, the verse says that in what I consider to be a very large area, particularly when I realize that, that he didn't have the tools that we have, to spread the good news, that God worked through Paul to bring to completion the good news of Jesus Christ in an area that represented a tremendous proportion of the civilized world. So I've strived to proclaim the good news not where Christ was already named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. And boy, did that verse keep me up half the night. There's a tremendous amount of commentary on this verse, particularly written by ministers. It would look like the, the verse is saying, you know, my ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard rather than where a, a ch church has already been started by somebody else. That's, the, that's basically the New Living Translation. You know, that Paul doesn't want to mess anybody else up. He want, and he wants to get the glory of being the first person to preach the gospel someplace. I'm going to tell you what I think this verse means. And, again, maybe you get tired of hearing it, but I have to continually attach the conditional clause that I'm no source of truth. I'll tell you what I think the verse means is I wrestled with it you know, until the wee hours of the morning because I couldn't help but see some complications in my mind that came about as I studied and meditated and prayed over it. You have to decide, folks, whether it makes any sense or maybe you have a better meaning or maybe you know other passages of Scripture that I've ignored that would read against what I'm going to suggest. But uh, here's where the real meat of this video begins, and I'm going to so it'll all, be, it'll all be focused on verse 20. And I'll show you the problems that I had in my mind as, as I came across this verse. The questions that I had to ask. I couldn't just read over this without stopping. And, and uh, my feet kind of got stuck, stuck in the mud because I wouldn't let it go. I wouldn't I could not leave verse 20 until I understand until I came to understand why would Paul be saying what he's saying. So let's get into that. All right, let's back up just a bit. Verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. As I prefer to say, because the word in the original text is, is spirit. And verse 14, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able, a, also, able also to admonish one another. And I read these verses. And, and I, here's what I say to myself. I say, that the, the, it is only through God's word, God's truth, this book, it's only through truth that we could be filled with all, all joy and peace and believing, that, that we would abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit, that, that we could be full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, all knowledge, and able to admonish one another. It has to be speaking of truth. So there's an emphasis on his word. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace 
that is given to me of God. Don't skip over that word grace, folks. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. That the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. It's important Paul is, is pointing out the fact that what he was preaching had to be set apart by the Holy Spirit. It had to be the, the truth of the gospel of God, or it had to be the true gospel of Christ. That he had to be, he had, he could not be preaching in and of himself some other gospel or some other doctrine, presenting some other doctrine to the Gentiles other than what God had given him to preach. God gave Paul a specific gospel to preach and that's what he preached and there's an emphasis on that and as far as his involvement in it the privilege that he had to do that he says for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed Christ does it God does it the word does it the gospel does it not Paul are you getting that through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And we get to verse 20. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel. And the word strived is to have zeal. In, the word in the original text, folks, means to be enthusiastic, to have great, tremendous zeal and enthusiasm and motivation and drive to to uh, to do something just think of anything that you're passionate about so passionate that you just it's you, there's a tremendous enthusiasm to be involved in it that's the meaning of the word so have I strived to preach the gospel not and this is a key word here We've got to stop and think about it. Not. There was no enthusiasm. Zero drive. Zero motivation. Zero. Not. No, no enthusiasm, folks, to preach the gospel. I mean, you know, don't, don't jump over this here. Okay? This is, this is where I first got bogged down. This is what... This is what took and shook me by the core. At, you know, shook me. Just, I, I hardly know how to put into words just how this, I got, I, the text stopped me dead in my tracks were that I had to ask myself the all-important question as it pertains to the gospel which Paul says he was so enthusiastic to, to preach, that he strived to preach. What could possibly make Paul not want to preach it someplace. Not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. And the word build is to edify, literally build someone up, helping them to stand, be strong or sturdy. And Paul don't want to do that. He doesn't want to do that where, and where does he not want to do that? Where Christ was named. Why? Why not? Churches do it all the time. Pastors invite guest speakers all the time. I mean, it's, it's just, if, if you know anything about the modern Christianity, you know, you would have to admit that they kind of have a different mind about this than Paul. Okay? They don't, they don't have any qualms at whatsoever about preaching the gospel where Christ is already named and building upon that foundation. Are, are, you, are you getting, are you understanding my concern here about Paul's words? That's why I've underlined them in red. I'm going to tell you what I think this means. Uh, it may take a little bit of effort on my part. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. That's verse 21. 
I know we jumped ahead, but I'll come back to 20. It's a quote, not an exact quote, but a quote from uh, that reflects Isaiah 52, 15. I think what he's saying is, For the Messiah was not spoken of to the Gentiles. They were strangers to the covenant, the covenants of promise. Okay? And now, well, now, we come to, or we go back to, verse 20. And folks, I, I don't think I'm going to uh, do a very good job of explaining this, but I will try my best. Yea, so have I strived, and the word strived means enthusiasm, great zeal, to be involved in something of which you consider to be of great honor, to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation, which seems to me to contradict 1 Corinthians 3.10, okay, which, in which Paul says, as a wise master builder, and the word is architecto in the Greek, architect, I have laid a foundation. It's not the foundation. The original text is, I have laid a foundation, and another builds thereon. But just let every man take heed how he builds upon it. So there are others building upon the foundation that Paul laid, but back back looking back at our present text, Romans fifteen twenty, Paul has no enthusiasm, zero enthusiasm whatsoever to preach upon another man's foundation, and he has a reluctance to even build upon that foundation, which I find awfully strange unless unless I you know, something's going on here. Okay? We know from 1 Corinthians 3.11, For other foundation can no man lay than that which, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We know what the foundation is or who the foundation is. Actually, the word there, uh, the melios, really means, it's, 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 it actually extends beyond Christ, outward, away from Christ, to the apostles, to the church. Uh, the church itself is called the foundation, uh, the apostles, uh, the uh, the first root, of, the first principles of the Christian life and knowledge, you know, is considered to be the, the foundation. Very important word here, obviously. You know, any of you builders out there know how important a foundation is. So Paul says in first in First Corinthians three ten he laid a foundation. And another's building upon it. But in our present text, you know, he has no enthusiasm at all to preach upon that other man's foundation. He has a reluctance to build upon it. And and what do we do? What does modern Christianity do? It invites guest speakers to speak at their church all the time. Christians today don't think anything about building upon another man's foundation. You'd never hear uh, a, I guess, what? I, how should I say it, a, uh, just a modern conservative Christian evangelical uh, person today say, uh, I don't really want to go and preach the gospel over here, you know, where the, uh, Christ, the gospel is already being preached. And I certainly don't want to build upon uh, another church's foundation. I don't want to, I mean, you would never hear that. And Paul absolutely makes it absolutely crystal clear, clear that he has no desire to preach the gospel or build upon that same foundation which another laid while saying that, while saying, get this, while saying that there were others, saying that others were building upon the foundation that he laid. They just had to be, they, they just needed to be careful how they built upon it. It makes no sense whatsoever, folks, if another man's foundation, verse 20, was the foundation that Paul himself laid. That's my point. That's how I'm looking at that. The questions I had to ask were why would Paul express zero enthusiasm for preaching the gospel where Christ was named? when such a place, any place, would likely have those who would hear the gospel and believe. Surely they're not all saved, or surely they're not all, I mean, 
There's always tear and wheat that grow together. There's always going to be sheep and goats. So why? I mean, listen, folks, stop and think, okay? Think about it. Why would Paul express no enthusiasm whatsoever for preaching the gospel where Christ was named? Surely there are potential converts there when such a place would likely have those who would hear. Why would Paul have a reluctance to build upon the true foundation, the foundation of another, if it was in fact true? If it, if it was in fact the foundation that Paul laid? When he admits that there are those who are doing that when it comes to the foundation that he laid. And my only answer was because it was not the foundation he laid, of which there is no other. That's the way I'm looking at it. Uh, don't ask anybody to agree with me, but I just have to kind of like as a referee just call it as I see it. I want to thank you all for hanging in here through this, these studies in Romans. Uh, the reason they're getting so few views is because it is the gospel. It's not popular. They won't get a lot of views. We are living at a time in which the light is growing dim. I know our Lord is coming soon. He must be. There's just too many evidences pointing uh, to that fact. I hope you all continue to look up. If you haven't heard, uh, we're moving into Colossians. The decision was made to, to move into Colossians. When we do finish the epistle to the Romans, Lord willing. And so until next time, this is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.